Okay, let's go ahead and go through the process that we covered today in class um, for setting up the model and the UVs and doing a little bit of texturing on the body of this Gibson Les Paul guitar. I'm going to turn off my grid real fast and come in here and look at the edge flow. And something that I do want to point out is that um, a lot of times it's easier to solve your edge flow and your modeling roadmap before you even start doing your model. And so in this particular case, I took it into Photoshop and I drew out the direction of the edge flow and got all of that figured out. And I'm pretty sure all this is going to work well. And now all I really need to do is trace it here in Maya. Something else I want to point out as I went in and revised this just a little bit more. Um, and so it's, it's a newer version of the, um, of the edge flow layout than even what we worked on in class. So I'm just going to oops, hop over here into our four viewport mode and go to the front view. And I will get started by drawing a plane that covers half of my model right here. Okay, now that that plane is in place, I will go into select edge mode. And I want to grab this edge. I'm going to hold down X so that I get it to snap right here to the center of the grid, right, which is centered with our reference. I'm going to grab this top edge, make sure it lines right up there with my reference at the top. This one is pretty darn close, and this bottom edge, I'll go ahead and bring that down in there like so. All right. Now I will grab my Insert Edge Loop tool, and where I have these um, kind of straight shot edges, I'm going to go ahead and, and draw those in with this tool, like that. Okay, now that this is done, I'll right click go into object mode and select this. Now I'm going to hold down D is in dog, X is in X-ray, so that I snap the pivot point right here to this particular edge, which also happens to fall on the center of our grid. The reason for this is I'm going to click on edit and come down to duplicate special and go to the options box, because we're going to create an instance um, for the other side of this model that as we're doing all the modeling and adjusting, to the geometry on the left side, it will automatically perpetuate that to everything on the right side of our object. So I want these settings right here, the geometry type, I want it to be an instance, group under parent. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just group this under world. Um, translate all zero, rotate all zero, negative one for the X scale axis with a positive one for the Y and the Z, and leave the number of, of copies set to one. I'll go ahead and hit duplicate special. And now you'll see this extra piece of geometry right over in here. Uh, I'm going to select both of these objects, and I'm going to add them to this layer one that I've already created. Now double click on layer one so that the edit layer palette pulls up here, and I'm going to go ahead and call this body. All right, and then for the color, we'll go ahead and leave this set to index. I'm going to choose this red swatch right here and hit save. And the cool thing is, is as we are viewing this with X-ray mode turned on and also with, um, with the wireframe unshaded turned on, that wireframe will end up being red as opposed to blue. So now we can just come in here and simply start adjusting our geometry. It looks like my snap grid is turned on, so I'm going to disable that right at the top. And you can see as I pull this vertice in on this side, it automatically does the same thing on the corresponding side. All right, so go ahead and start getting things positioned in here. All right, and I'll take this edge and go, or this person, go ahead and move it up there like so. And now I'll grab my multi-cut tool and start focusing on all the edges that are running in towards the center and running across my geometry. All right, now I did make this into a triangular shaped face, and we'll actually fix that in a little bit. I'll press Y on my keyboard to grab the multi-cut tool again.
I'm not going to provide a whole lot of commentary on what I'm doing because I feel like this process is relatively straightforward. We'll grab these vertices right here though and use a scale tool to scale them all so they fall into one nice little line there. And as I go in and, yeah, and start adding in extra edges and stuff, I usually will just go back in and just kind of tweak the positioning of these new vertices to better match what's going on with my model. We can clean up these edges right here now. reposition these vertices to match my reference. Actually, I'm going to draw in from here down to that corner. And for the moment, it'll make a couple of three-sided faces out of that. And we will come in here and add in some extra edge flow to compensate for that. Position those vertices. All right, now I think I can use the insert edge loop tool to create that edge right through there. Yeah, I'm just going to look over everything real quickly to make sure that things are set up the way that they should be. All right, and I think I have everything. Now, um, the guitar is symmetrical as we've laid everything out here. But in our reference, you can see that it's not symmetrical um, right in this little negative space kind of way. And so we'll actually deal with that now. So I want to select these two halves. Um, this is one of the reasons why we created the instance. We created it as per the world and not as per a parent or a group. Um, so that I can easily select these two, click on mesh and combine them. And then we'll grab these vertices along this shared edge and click on edit mesh and merge. All right, so now we've merged this all into one object. Now, if it's not wanting to combine, all you need to do is click on edit and come down to unparent and then go through that same process of combining and merging those vertices. All right, now I'm going to take these four faces right here and delete them. And we need to come in and we need to start repositioning some of the pre-existing geometry to favor um, the edge flow and the form of this section of the guitar. All right, I'm gonna bring this down in here like so. Actually going to bring this up close, but just where it aligns with this particular edge right in there. All right, and I'll take this guy, move him down like so. All right, now let's grab the multi-cut tool and start doing a uh, little adjusting.
Now, granted, I am going to need to go through after I'm done with this and do a fair amount of cleanup. All right, I'm actually going to take these two vertices right here and I'll just merge those into one. And then that will resolve the weird little triangle that we had there. And now we need to come in here and delete all of these edges that are contributing to three-sided faces. Looks like I need to get rid of those two right there. So we'll go ahead and hide the ortho layer. And have something weird going on here. So let's go ahead and select those three and we'll merge them into one. And there we go. I think the edge flow is set up correctly. Now we can test the edge flow by selecting one face and shift and double clicking on the edge next to it. All right, and if we have good edge flow, it should select the faces as per that edge flow. All right, so I think I got it all exactly the way that I want it to be. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to come in here, I'll turn my orthos back on, and we're going to arch the top of this guitar. All right, because these Gibson guitars are not just simply flat across the top, they're actually, they have a little bit of a domed surface, a um, convex surface. So, from the side of this object, I'll go ahead and select it in object mode. And actually, the, or the uh, pivot point is all the way up here in the center of our grid. So we'll click on Modify and come down to center that pivot. Let's go ahead and drag this forward right to this point right here, where you can see where this, this arched top starts to flatten out right in through there. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to go to the Rigging tab, and we're going to click on this icon right here. Okay, it's create a lattice, and it, the lattice is a type of deformer, where what it does is it throws a box, you know, because we're dealing with a plane, and it creates a two-dimensional kind of box, if you want to think about it that way, around our object. So if I right-click on the lattice and grab the lattice point, I can actually start to deform the model as per that position on the lattice, or the position of that point on the lattice. Now, by default, um, in the um, inputs for the lattice, we have ST and U divisions. Um, so the, the S is the width, so that's these two edges right here. The T is the height, so that's one, two, three, four, five. And then the U is the depth. And since this is a two-dimensional object, we won't even worry about the U. Let's go ahead and enter in a value of 8 for the S and 8 for the T, and then right-click on this and select the lattice point. We just want to grab just these four points right here, right in the center of our guitar, and hit B on your keyboard. That will turn your soft select on. Now, if I hold down B and scrub, I can increase the influence or decrease the influence of the fall-off of that soft select. Now, what's really nice about the soft select is as we grab these points right here and pull them out, it's going to have, you know, varying or a slightly diminished area of influence um, on the other lattice points as we pull this forward. Um, I hope that makes sense. But what we're going to do is we're going to pull it as far as our reference dictates right in through here. Okay, now that we've arched the top of this guitar, go ahead and select the geometry, not the uh, lattice deformer, but the geometry in object mode, and click on edit, and come down to delete by type and delete the history, and that will delete the lattice deformer, but preserving the deformations that we just made. Now right click, go on to select edge mode, double click on one of these edges. Actually, I'm gonna press B to turn off the soft select. Double click on one of these edges right here. <clears throat> so it selects the entire circumference of the model. I'm going to press R on my keyboard. And I'm going to scale that selection of edges down flat. Okay, now that that's been done, let's go ahead and bring that into place right here, lining back up with a flat spot on our guitar. Let's take the object now, go back into the polygons tab, 
double click on the extrude to make sure that you're only extruding at one division and hit extrude. Now instead of using these kind of general translate and, and manipulator handles, I'm going to just press W on my keyboard to use a regular world translate tool. I'm going to translate that back as deep as um, is the back of the guitar. All right. I kind of overshot it a little bit because now I'm going to use a scale tool by pressing R to scale all that flat there in the back. You know, thusly getting rid of the resulting concavity that we had in the back, which is a result to the convex um, nature of the front of the guitar. Now because we extruded it back instead of extruding it forward, it turned our model inside out. So go ahead and select your model, click on Mesh Tools and come down to Reverse to reverse the normals on those faces so that they are now right side out. Okay, And there we go, we have the basic body for the guitar right there. Now what we need to do is go into Hypershade and I've created a blend material and assigned the checkerboard pattern to the color channel on that blend material. Let me just drag it out here and drop it onto my guitar and take a look at the UVs. Um, you can see they're a little wonky, and a big part of this is, is because you know we, we basically mirrored um, one half of the first part of the model and then merged them together, and that's why we're getting you know this mirroring going on right here. But because we just simply extruded this back, you know it's it's done kind of a number on the UVs that represent the depth of our model. So let's go ahead and manually adjust the UV. So I'll click on UV right here. Come down to the UV editor and just move it off here to the side. Make sure your little dimmer switch is turned on so you can see what's going on. Then you can see that this doesn't really match that all that gracefully. So I'm gonna click on the UV menu and come down to Planar and go to the Options box. And we're going to do a planar map of this and we want to do it along the X axis because that is the axis um, to which the front and the back of our model are perpendicular. So go ahead and project that, and now we should start to see something that looks a lot more like what we would expect from this model. Now, it works for the front, it works for the back, but it, it kind of looks like crap um, for the depth of the guitar. So I'll fix that by clicking on one face, holding down shift, and double clicking on the adjacent face, so we select the edge flow going around you know, the perimeter of the guitar. And instead of doing a planar map, we're actually going to come in here and do a cylindrical map. Now, the cylindrical map, when viewed from the side, looks cool. When we see it from the top, it looks like crap. And the reason for that is, is look at the orientation of the projection right here. All right, So the cylinder is running around the guitar as if this were the north pole and this were the south pole down in here. What we want to do is we want to change the orientation of this projection. Can do that by going to the attribute editor and right here in the projection attributes we can rotate this 90 degrees on the x-axis and 180 degrees on the z-axis and then that's going to give us a nice orientation. Okay now you know in a lot of instances we're getting some you know something nice that's happening but in a few other faces we're getting some stretching here we're getting some compressing and condensing there so I'm going to go ahead and click on this object in shell mode and just kind of move it up and out of the way. Now in the viewport, I'll select this edge so I know which edge is the offending edge and right click, go into UVs and let's select everything up to that point so that I can start moving things around and trying to alleviate some of the stretching that's occurring right there. So I'm going to select this in shell mode, and I actually think I need to scale it down like so. Okay, once again, I'm going to grab these UVs right in through here. And just finesse the positioning a little bit. All right, looks like I'm going to deselect a couple of these. Actually, I'm going to select them over here on the other side. All right, deselect those right in through there. Deselect that one.
And mostly what I'm just trying to do is reallocate these to minimize the amount of stretching that ends up occurring on our texture. So now let's do the same thing for the other side. And I could probably finesse it more, but we will go ahead and go with that right there. <clears throat> okay, now one thing I am noticing is that the texture is stretching just a little bit on the front of the guitar. So I selected both the front and the back in shell mode, and I will go ahead and translate those inwards to better distribute that pattern. Now I'll click on the object in object mode and click on polygons in the uh, UV editor submenu and come down to layout and it should go ahead and place everything nicely within this upper quadrant for us. Now I don't necessarily want my, um, my UVs to be so close together so I'm going to just come in and just kind of manually space them out a little bit. Um, when possible I like to have a little bit of space around my UVs just in my opinion makes things a little easier to work with okay and now what we can do now that we've laid out the UVs with the object in um, you know in a relative um, low poly mode we can come in and we can add in additional edge loops so I'll grab the insert edge loop tool okay and add in an edge loop in through here and one in through there um, you can see that it's actually adding those edge loops to my UV sets right over in here. So I can add in an edge loop here, and then also come around in through here and add in an edge loop. All right, and that'll help maintain those hard edges where we want them um, on our model right in through here. Okay. Now I'm gonna cheat this corner right here. Um, because I, I want this corner to pull tight, but I don't want to insert any additional edges that are going to, or any additional edge loops that are possibly going to cause problems elsewhere in the model. So I'll go into smooth preview mode and click on mesh tool and come down to crease and then middle mouse click and scrub and pull that forward. And actually, as I do that, I'm gonna grab just a little bit of a spillover on some of these edges. Let's see if going that far um, does a trick. So we'll come down and do the crease again. But I'll mouse click and pull it up like so. All right. But the one problem that we're getting is, you know, right down in here, um, maybe we can go ahead and crease those edges as well. Just so, just to, we're trying to do, make sure that we get the least amount of warping on those UVs as possible. Okay, so with that being creased now, um, you know, we get a nice sharp edge right here that matches our reference. And, um, you know, everything else it seems to look good as per our reference. Now, one thing that I do want to point out, a lot of times with UVs, where the UVs spill into a seam, they start to kind of stretch and contort a little bit. One way that we can fix that is by taking our model and clicking on edit, I'm going to come down and, and delete all my type, so delete the history on this. And then in the attribute editor, I want to go to the plain shape tab. In the plain shape tab, go to the smooth mesh drop down and come down to the open subdiv controls. 
Under the UV boundary smoothing, go ahead and select Preserve Edges and Corners, and it's going to do a much better job um, allocating the UV uh, with the texture distribution along the UVs without causing any stretching as it goes into those seams. Okay. And now with this selected, let's come back into the UV Texture Editor, click on Polygons, come down to UV Snapshot, and drag this in from another monitor that I had. I'm going to go ahead and specify this as out UV underscore body. And for the size, I'm going to do a 2K texture map, so 2048 by 2048. I'm going to export this out as a TIFF. And I'll go ahead and hit OK and overwrite that file um, that was there previously. And now what I'm going to do is hop over into Photoshop. And I'll go ahead and close up what's already there. All right, that's our wood texture that we'll be using, so I'll leave that document open. And I will go ahead now and open up my UV map. I'll hit Command-I to change it from white on black to black on white. Double-click on the background layer. And, yeah, we'll go ahead and name this UVs. Okay, I'm going to come over to my maple texture and I'll copy that just with command A and then command C. Then go back into this um, UV map right here and let's go ahead and just paste that texture. Now with that texture pasted, I'm going to drag it down underneath our UV layer and set the UV layer to multiply. Now we'll go ahead and take this layer right here and I'm going to duplicate it and then uh, turn off the visibility on the original. That way, I just like to have the original so that if I ever need to default back to it, it's already here and present in my document. So I'm going to hit Command-T on this, and I'm going to scale this texture down to a point where it, it seems to work well with the texture of my model, or the texture of my UV, or the scale of my UVs, rather, sorry. Um, and also, I'm going to rotate it a little bit, because what we're going to do is we're going to mirror um, certain aspects of this wood grain and it's easier to tell that it's mirrored when it's rotated just a little bit. So I'll press M on my keyboard to grab the marquee tool and drag a selection over half of my model. And I'm going to zoom in just a little bit and hit M and tap my selection over a hair to about right there. Now I'm going to hit Command J to duplicate that. Now that this duplicate has been made, we'll hit Command T to go into free transform mode, and I want to transform this negative 100 on the width. Okay, and let's go ahead and drag that over here like so. And just nudge that texture into place. All right, so we have a nice little mirrored image. And... Unfortunately, I just realized I did something dumb and I didn't quite select as much as I should. So I'm going to cheat this and just kind of transform this out just beyond uh, the edge of our UV. And hopefully that won't make too noticeable of a difference in the layout of our textures. Okay. But now that I've done that, I'm going to go ahead and hit Command E to merge the, those two images down and together. I'm going to drag a selection over the full guitar here or this full UV set, hit Command J and duplicate that, and then drag that over to the other side. All right, and then go ahead and center that as per this UV set. Okay, I'm going to merge those two together. Now I'm going to take this original layer, I'm going to duplicate that again, and turn that on. Now I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees here. All right, and I'm holding down shift so that it snaps. Um, it, I think it snaps to 15 degree increments. I'm going to go ahead and scale that texture down. Scale it down just a little bit more. And drag it over here to where it corresponds with, um, with this side right here. And I'm just going to do my best to try and scale it to where the scale of the wood grain matches the scale 
on these two pieces of, or these two UVs right there. And I'll go ahead and press return on that, right, and merge that up into this layer here. And let's go ahead and call this just wood grain. And I'll turn off the UV layer now and do a save as on this. And in the save as, I want to save this, instead of in my images folder, I want to save this into my source images folder. And I'm going to call this body underscore diff for diffuse. And I'm going to change this from a TIFF to a Photoshop document. And go ahead and hit save. All right. Now let's hop back over into Maya. I can close my UV editor. And I am going to create a new MIA material. All right, I want to do MIA material X. So I'll select that and then double click on it here so that it opens up in our attribute editor. I'm not going to mess with any of the presets, but for the diffuse, I'll go ahead and click on the create input node. And we'll select a PSD file, click on the folder. Let's go ahead and select that body underscore diff and hit open. Okay, now let's take that material and go ahead and apply it to our guitar. All right, just like that. And I think that looks really nice. Um, you know, with the exception of a little, little stretching going on right there, with the textures. I might need to play around with that just a little bit here, but we'll, we'll just leave it alone for the moment. And let's turn on our film gate. I'll go to the outliner, select the perspective camera, go into the channel box, set the horizontal film aperture to one and the vertical film aperture also to one. I'm gonna drag this little divider between the outliner and the viewport out just a little bit. Go to our render settings. Make sure that the quality is set to 1. In the legacy settings, I want to make sure that I have final gathering turned on. I'll go to the common tab and set my preset at least to a 1K square. Okay, And let's close this. Position my model right here and do a render. All right. Um, let's let's come in here and let's take this edge right here. We'll take that edge and go to Mesh Tools. And I'm going to come down to Crease once again. And I'm going to just kind of scrub that until that goes away. I think I'll do the same with these two as well. Hit G. Select from here to here, hit G. Uh, we'll just leave that alone for the moment. All right, let's turn our orthos off now and um, start doing some fun stuff with our model as, as far as the textures are concerned. Mm. So hopping back over into Maya, I'm going to create a new layer. And I'm gonna go ahead, I currently have red as, as my uh, foreground color. I'm gonna go ahead and do a red fill. And then click on normal, and I'm gonna come down to multiply. Now, that's pretty darn extreme. I'm gonna hit Command U, and that'll bring up my hue saturation. Let's see if I can grab it here in the other window and drag it over. And I'm going to desaturate this some. Um, I'm going to make it a little darker. And instead of being red, I want it to have kind of an orange sort of base. All right, maybe even a yellow orange. All right, something like that. Now for the wood grain, I'm going to take that and I'm going to hit Command L to get my levels. 
and drag this in and try and create a little bit more contrast in the wood grain itself. Okay, let's go ahead and turn on our UVs. I'll go ahead and call this, um, we'll just call that fill. I'm going to create another layer and zoom in a couple of times and grab a brush. And now we're, what I want to do is I want to paint in a little bit of a starburst. All right, so I'm going to take this color that we have here and I'm going to um, make it a little less saturated and, and considerably darker. Now on this new layer, let's go ahead and set that to multiply. And then we'll grab our brush and I want to right click. And I'm going to take this brush right here. All right, I really like this brush because um, it's, it's a soft brush that'll have a good application for what we're using for. But it's also a brush that the more pressure you put on the brush, the more opaque it paints. And I'm going to turn on our flow. I'm going to set the flow value to 25%. And come in here and go around the edge of our guitar. Actually, as I go around it, I'm going to try and make it get gradually darker. All right. I'm going to just build that up a little bit. Let's push this in just a little bit more. All right. Let's have that get darker still. All right, so I'm relatively satisfied with how that's looking. So I'm going to grab the marquee tool and just drag a little bit of a selection over top of that. So let's make that selection a little bit larger. I will hit Command Shift I to invert the selection, then hit Delete to delete all the excess. All right, and I'll re-invert that selection with Command Shift I and hit Command J. So I create a duplicate of it. Now with this duplicate, I'll hit Command T, come up to my free transform width settings, enter a negative 100, so I flip that, and then let's go ahead and reposition that right there, and then merge those two down, and we'll call this one Sunburst. All right, so let's go ahead and turn off the UVs, hit Save, go back over to Maya, and so I'll go ahead and save that render right there. Let's go back to Hypershade, select the material, go to the Attribute Editor, and tell it to reload that texture. Okay, and do another render. All right, now one of the reasons why it's kind of getting washed out is it's the contrast that's contained within our um, image-based lighting right in here. Now we can also paint just a little bit more contrast into the guitar as well, um, which I actually think I might do here. I'm going to hit Command L and just go into the levels and bring that up a little bit. Hit OK. Let's go ahead and resave this. And... Reload that in Maya. All right, save that and do another quick render. Okay, but one other thing with these guitars is a lot of times there's a plastic edging that goes all the way around the perimeter of the model. And, you know, I could go in and actually paint that perimeter in manually in Photoshop, but I think it's actually going to be easier if I use Illustrator to help me out. So I'm going to set up a new Illustrator document. I just need to move this in from another screen. 
I'm going to set it from inches to, to um, pixels and set this width to 2048 by 2048 so that it matches the settings. All right, drag this in here and I'll go ahead and expand that. Get command zero. So that matches the settings of the document that I want to place in here. So we'll go ahead and select place from the file menu and I will find where I have this saved real fast. Let's see, I have it in my personal folder. Go ahead and go to source images, body dot underscore diff hit place. Just go ahead and click that and then just place it into my document like so. Okay, and I have my menus in my other screen, so I'm just going to drag them in right here. And in the Layers palette, let's go ahead and lock this and then create a new layer for the artwork that we'll be creating on top of that right there. And I'm going to drag in my Tool uh, palette uh, and just go ahead and place it there like so. Now, my UVs aren't turned on, so I'm actually going to hop back over into Maya and turn on my UVs right here. Now, it's a little hard to see the black on top of some of these darker values that we're working with. So I'm going to re-invert that with Command-I. Then I change it from a multiply blending opacity mode back down to overlay. Or sorry, not overlay, down to screen. So it ends up being white on black, and it's just easier for me to see. And now what we'll do is oh, we need to save it um, here in Photoshop. And then the artwork should... It should recognize that changes have been made, so we can just go ahead and tell it to yes, go ahead and update that. And now, let's go ahead and turn off the fill, come to the stroke. I'm going to change the color of my stroke to um, something that's easy to see, like a blue. All right, so 255 right there. And let's go ahead and zoom in on our guitar like this. And now, just kind of trace the contours. All right, when I say trace the contours, I mean trace the contours utilizing the pen tool. Right, and it doesn't have to be perfect because we'll always be able to go in and fix it up. Okay, so now I'll come in here with the direct select tool. So that is A on your keyboard, and that lets you come into the individual points and, um, and adjust the BZA curve handles. All right, if I grab my regular pen tool, mouse over the line, I can add a new point to the line right here and go ahead and kind of fudge that out. Right, add a new point right there. Fudge that out just a little bit. Okay, I'm going to leave that alone right there. Come in here. And you know what? I'm just going to add another point in there. Just kind of scooch it out and around.
All right, now let's go ahead and come in here and add some weight to this line. I think I'm gonna do about that much and I'll come down to this tab for the transparency. Let's set the transparency of this to uh, 50 just to make sure it's going around and getting everything the way that I want it to. And I, I think that looks just fine like that. So if I hold down Alt and click on this and then Shift, I can drag out a copy. And then using uh, or this tool right here, O, will give us either the Reflect tool or the Rotate tool. But with the Reflect tool, I can double click on it and it'll bring up this little window right here. We can tell it to reflect vertically. Go ahead and hit OK. And then we can use the arrow keys and just kind of put that into position like so. And then I want to do the same thing for the edges on the guitar right here. So I just want to hold down shift as I draw this line in and that'll make it actually it remain straight. Uh, I'm going to set the transparency of this to 50 also just for the moment. I want to come in here and, and do a better job positioning this line. All right, so hold down Alt, click on that, and Shift, and drag a duplicate over like so. All right, and so using Illustrator get, allows us to get some really super nice clean lines. So let's go ahead and select everything. Go change your opacity from 50 back to 100, and I'm going to double click on the line swatch and let's actually choose something that's a little bit of an off-white that I, I think will better complement the colors that, that we're rocking right here um, in our design for this guitar. So with that selected, I'm going to go ahead and hit Command C, come over to Photoshop and we'll paste these. And as we paste these, it'll ask us if we want to paste them as smart objects, pixels, pads, etc. We're going to go ahead and go with pixels. And what it's going to do is it's going to constrain the scale as per the document size. Let's just click on the link right up here at the top and then tell that to keep it at 100%. And then we'll go ahead and just position these. If I press V on my keyboard so I have the regular select tool enabled, I can just hit 5 and tweak the opacity. Five will end up putting the opacity at 50%. And then we can go ahead and place these to where it looks like they best match our, um, our reference. All right. Actually, what did I do? All right, I'm gonna reposition these. All right, that looks good. I think all around. Now, let's go ahead and place that beneath our UV layer and then turn those UVs off. And then turn our opacity back to 100% like so. Go ahead and save this. And then reapply it here in Photoshop. And there we go, we have that really nice edge. Let's go ahead and do another render. All right, except for right there at the top where things got a little messed up when I had that hard edge in there. Dog on that hard edge. Um, I'm going to see if I can reapply that one more time. Come in here. Crease. Take those two, increase them. Increase this guy. A little bit.
All right, if we, if we look at the UVs without that crease being enabled, And it'll it'll show us the reason why that texture is getting a little messed up here. Come on. All right, so that that should be curving like that. Um, let's go ahead and re-export this. Take the UV snapshot. Oh, UV underscore body. Okay, we'll go ahead and overwrite the file that's there. All right, um, and I'll open that in Photoshop. I don't think I'm in the right folder. Okay, I'll right click on that, open with Photoshop. Go ahead and copy this. I'll paste it here. Tell it to do that as a screen. We'll rename this one as UVs. Go ahead and delete that. Actually, we'll save this. Hop back over to Illustrator. Tell it to go ahead and update the artwork. And the nice thing is with Illustrator is I think we should just be able to grab this point and then you have this little icon right in here that should, in theory, it doesn't look like it's working 100%. Yeah, well, that's that's close enough. So I'll bring that down like so. Okay, I'm going to set that opacity back to 100%. Let's go ahead and copy these. Go back to Photoshop, repaste these. And go ahead and reposition them. Whoa, 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 whoa. There we go. Right, like so. Let's go ahead and delete that layer. Name this one Edging. Save that. Come back over into Maya. Reload that, and there we go. That looks that looks better. Okay, so the next thing that I want to talk with you guys about real fast is just applying a little bit of a bump map and a little bit of a specular map. Now, with the bump map, what we can do is that will affect where and how the specularity and also where and how um, some really subtle shadows will play across the surface of our object. All right, so I'm going to close the render view. And let's go ahead and go over into Photoshop right here. And I will do a save as. And we're going to save this as body underscore um, bump. All right. Now, with this bump map, we don't need the starburst. We can go ahead and delete that. Um, don't need the fill. We can go ahead and delete that. Let's take everything else and flatten it down and then convert it to grayscale. Actually, before I flatten it down, I'm going to do this independently, the edging from the wood. Uh, bump map works it is a just regular black and white map. And what you see is black is actually going to be pressed down into the wood, and what's a lighter value is going to remain, you know, what, what's like a middle gray isn't really going to have any influence on it at all. But what is painted as white is it going to end up raising. So I think I'm going to leave the values um, relatively alone. You know, if anything in the wood grain, I could come in and um, give the darks a little bit more contrast. But I want it to be kind of subtle for this map, so I'm going to leave it as it is. So I'm going to go ahead and save this bump map. 
And we'll come back over to Maya and go to the MIA material. And if I look down here, there's a bump drop down. Let's go ahead and create a, a new input uh, node for the overall bump. We'll select that as a PSD file. And for the PSD texture, let's go ahead and click on that, fo on that uh, folder right there and select that body underscore bump and hit open. Now this is going to give it, a little bit, give it a little bit of a wood grain texture. Now a bump depth value of one is going to be really uh, too much of an overstatement. It's going to be really exaggerated. Like, let's see what it looks like if we turn this down to even a point 0.1. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and save this and do a test render. All right, I'm going to pause this render and we'll come back to it as soon as it's complete. Okay, that looks like crap. <laughs> that bump depth, it, it, even a tenth of the original value, um, is still way too pronounced. You know, it puts way too much emphasis on the texture of the wood grain itself. So let's go ahead and try and make this 0.01, which is a hundredth of the original strength. So we'll save that render and go ahead and do another one. And uh, hopefully this, this one should actually go relatively quickly is every time that the calculation is less pronounced, um, it's easier for Maya to go ahead and do its job. And I even think this is going to be a little too much as well. All right, and what's interesting is you see this texture. Actually, I'm gonna go ahead and save this and scrub back and forth between the two. You know, just even so subtle, it's amazing how too busy, too strong it can end up being. Um, let's make this one thousandth of the setting of, of the original setting, so 0 0.001, and go ahead and render that. And we just want it to just ever so subtly affect the surface of this material. All right. Um, we don't want it to be pronounced at all, but we just kind of mar that surface and break up that reflection just a little bit. That's where things really start looking nice and, and beautiful and a, a lot more realistic. Okay, so at a thousandth of the original setting, I think that's looking pretty decent. All right, so this is the original setting. This is where we're at with that, you know, really, really reduced. All right, now one other thing that I want to show you guys is um, just real fast, I didn't get a chance to touch on this in class, but I want to show you guys how to do a specular map. So in the event that you wanted to have a sticker, or something like that that has a papery matte kind of surface, we can go ahead and easily apply that right down in here and give it a matte finish relative to the shiny glossiness of this MIA material. Okay, so let's hop back over to Photoshop. And I have some artwork that I've previously prepared, um, just a little crossover art between um, SpongeBob and Batman, Patrick is Robin. And um, I'm going to just go ahead and take this, this image and copy it and go into my body underscore diff file and I'll, I'll go ahead and paste this. And we'll pretend that somebody put these two ugly stickers on this beautiful Gibson guitar because they thought they were being cool. All right, so I'm going to come down here and let's go ahead and translate this and you know when people put stickers on guitars and a lot of times it seems like they're just kind of haphazardly placed so I'm gonna go ahead and I think position about like so all right now let's go ahead and save the body um, underscore diff and I'm gonna go ahead and close this file right here and with the bump file um, I'm going to drag the body underscore diff Photoshop document out like so. And if I hit Alt and then Shift and grab this folder or this layer and drag it and drop it into another document, it will place that exactly where it belongs um, relative to the other document that we just pulled it out of. I'm going to go ahead and save and close the body underscore diff. Now what I want to do with it here is actually I'm going to double click on that layer so it pulls up my layer styles. And in the layer style, I'm going to do a color overlay. 
So I want to make sure that color overlay is set to white. Go ahead and hit OK. All right. What that's going to do is it's going to create just a little bit of a raised appearance to the sticker relative to the rest of the texture applied to the body. All right. So let's save this. And now I'm going to do one more save as. And with this particular file, we're going to call this one body underscore spec and hit save. All right. I will take everything here. And um, uh, let's see, Let, let's take this layer right here, and I'm going to do a white fill on that layer. All right, that was just command and delete with white being the background color. Because what is white in this document will end up having 100% reflectivity, so it'll have nice specularity. Now with this SpongeBob sticker right here, um, I'm gonna double click on that again, go back into the color overlay, and let's change that white now to black. Okay, so as black, it's going to be 100% opaque. And I'm going to leave the edging alone because the edging will still have some reflectivity, but it's not going to be as shiny now as the lacquered body of the guitar. So let's go ahead and save this. Go back over into Maya. I'll go ahead and close out that render view. Go back into the MIA material in the attribute editor by double clicking on it. For the reflection map, go ahead and click on that icon that allow us to connect an input node. Select the PSD file. All right, you can see there's our, our sticker applied right down there. Go ahead and click on the folder and then come down to um, body underscore spec and hit open. All right, and now we actually should be able to see that. Um, so you can see how there's no specular highlight on that sticker at all. And it's a little, little tricky to see um, exactly how it's playing out across the, the strip going around the body of the guitar. But let's go ahead and do one last render and see how this looks. Right. Let's try and render that from a slightly different angle. Right, and that's essentially how you would get um, something like a sticker to work. Now, if you're not happy with the way, you know, if that doesn't look quite enough like it's it's raised off of the surface, um, you know, maybe it might look a little bit better for rendering, rendering it as a 2K image um, or a 4K image even. You know, go, go ahead and, and render it at a higher resolution and see if that works the way that you want it to. Um, you could go back in, play around with the contrast in your HDRI image. Um, and if you're still not quite getting the raised quality that you like for the sticker, you can actually apply that, that sticker as a displacement map on top of the bump map and, um, you know, and, and get a little bit more of a, of a specific finite effect. But let's see what this looks like in, as a 2K image as opposed to a 1K image. Yeah, this might just take a little longer to render, so I'm going to go ahead and pause the render real fast. All right, and here you go. Now we can, you know, zoom in all the way on it and, um, you know, really begin to enjoy the, the details that we have right here. I'll just go ahead and click on the one-to-one -one texture. And, and there you go.